Hey y'all, it's Jessie and welcome to my comics reading vlog. This was supposed to be a week of me vlogging reading comics. We vlogged the first week of Black and Bond where I read a bunch of books and then I wanted to do comics for the last week, but life got in the way of that. The reason I'm not daily vlogging this week is because I had like five videos that I had to get up. I had a skit that I wanted to do and a discussion and a collaboration. So it just was impossible to um to daily vlog on top of that i had to get this glass before my cat knocked it over because she's the devil also can y'all hear how deep my voice is sometimes i wake up and i sound like a young man i don't know why <laughs> does this happen to anybody else where your like vocal cords are just really low in the morning we're just gonna roll with it oh my god ow jesus raven you are so fucking evil, dude. Where'd you go? Oh, God. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna lean forward. What's wrong with you? <sighs> okay, I'm gonna move so she can stop attacking me. Do, do, do. Here's my messy apartment because I'm trash. Okay. Here, so now you can see me in the light. And you can see how ugly I am. During this vlog, I'm going to be reading volume two of Motor Crush. This is volume one, and you know I read and loved this book. And I really want to read Cyborg by David F. Walker. I haven't read any of the Cyborg comics. I, I don't read anything from DC, but David F. Walker is one of my favorite comic book writers of all time. He's the author of Superb, which is one of my favorite comics of all time. And he's also recently come out with Naomi number one, which I really want to read because I've loved his work so much. I really want to check out Cyborg. I'm also going to be reading Prism, another comic by Image. All I know about this comic is that it is Octavia Butler's writing meets Sailor Moon. And that was, that was good enough for me. You're gonna see a lot in this video. I have some book mail. I have a comic haul that I'm gonna show you later. We're gonna be making dinner. We're probably gonna go to the gym. We're gonna do all kinds of things. So I'm gonna start reading and check back in with you later. It is later in the day. I finally showered, got dressed, cleaned the house, had breakfast, played with the cat, and of course, read some comics. So I finished issue number two of Prism and I was like, what the hell is going on in this comic book? It is a psychedelic science fiction interspecial comic about a girl named Vep. Vep is... Vep is sent away from her home world by a private military organization who has charged her with the task of helping colonize a new planet. But once she is displaced from her family and culture and all of her friends, she finds that she has a mysterious power on this new planet. What first drew me into this comic book was all of the neon colors, the psychedelics, and how psychosomatic the comic was in general. But my favorite thing about it so far is the badass technology. There's a lot of really creative use of technology and world building in this comic so I completely understand where the Octavia Butler-esque influence comes from. There is a lot of messages about loss of culture and assimilation and how language is a tool that we can use to stay connected to our ancestors and our ancestral power. All of this being said, I wasn't really enjoying the comic as much as I wanted. It had a lot of prose and it was very abstract and complex. So I took a break from reading it and looked up the writer an artist, Sloane Leon, and just read some interviews about her discussing the comic so that I could understand it better, and that helped so much. Raven, can you get off the table? You are shaking the camera. I know, you look so comfortable and warm in the sun. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Make up for what you've done to me. I love you. 
So it turns out that you're supposed to listen to this soundtrack that Sloan had made while you're reading the comic. According to the writer, the soundtrack is supposed to be like sonic snapshots of the world, and it helps to deliver the appropriate emotion and anticipation and tangibility to this comic because it is so abstract. And once I started playing the music and getting a feel for how it informed and paced the story, I enjoyed the comic a lot better. Another thing that was really helpful from her interviews was she talked about how she grew up in Hawaii where the landscape is incredibly diverse diverse and ever-changing. And the writer talks about how often in science fiction or even in fantasy, the worlds that we build still mirror the technology and the architecture that we see in the West or in Europe, which is absolutely true. And I think that was why it was so hard for me to get into the comic at first, because it's truly innovative. It's not just Europe on another planet. It is its entirely own creation. And it has a lot of influences from Hawaii coloring and culture and context. So now that I know all of this, I'm gonna go back, reread the first two issues, and then and complete the last three issues and let you know what I think. Also started volume two of A Motor Crush. I'm sorry that I forgot to tell you guys what this comic is about. I've just talked about it so much on my channel that I forgot to give you a synopsis. This comic is about 23 year old Domino who is a black queer racer for the World Grand Prix. She competes for fame and fortune on the World Grand Prix, but at night she is a part of illegal street races for a accelerant called Crush. Crush is a outlawed accelerant that is used to make your motorcycle faster. A lot of the bicycle gangs in this world use Crush in order to attain power and to basically bully their opponents. But we find out very early on in the comic that Domino has asthma and in her inhaler, she is ingesting Crush. Now the mere fumes from Crush is enough to kill a human being. So the idea of ingesting it is absolutely absurd. At the end of volume one, we still didn't know how or why Domino needed to consume Crush in order to stay alive. And she has some pretty badass abilities that we are just now discovering as well. I don't wanna to spoil too much for you about this comic, but there is a time travel component. There is a lot of queerness, a lot of body positivity. There is disability rep. Domino is adopted and her adoptive father, Sully, who is an ex racer, has an amputated leg and walks with a prosthetic. And she has this really tumultuous relationship with Lola, who is a gorgeous mechanic that I absolutely cannot stand. Love the combination of Babs Tar with Brendan Fletcher. Babs does amazing art and it really brings the story to life. I already started volume two, I'm reading it online. I loved that volume two started with a flashback and was narrated by Domino's adoptive father, Sully, which was so good because I want answers. I want to know where Domino comes comes from. Why can she ingest Crush? What exactly are the nature of her powers? And how did Sully become an amputee? So far, volume two is even better than the first, which shocks me because this, this book blew me out of the water. The costumes are even better than the costumes in book one. I love Domino's style. I love her attitude and her intellect and her fierceness. And all of the characters around her feel very robust and well-defined. Okay, so that is it for now. I'm gonna continue reading these comics and then Rob and I are going to have lunch and I have to go to work. So I will check in with you in a little while. Hey y'all, this is gonna be the worst comic reading vlog ever because I wanted to get more days in, but it just, it just didn't work. I had so much to do for Blackathon. Like I had my collab and I had all the books that I was reading and everything. So I wanted to do like a full week of reading comics, but it just, it's just not gonna work out. So I promise I'm gonna give you a much better, more well-rounded with more comics, well-constructed comic reading vlog in the near future. Like I promise. I figured I would wrap up my thoughts on Motor Crush and also on Prism. Tonight I'm going to finish out Blackathon Strong by reading Shuri by Nedia Korafor. I'm also going to be reading Cyborg by David F. Walker. But I figured right now why not just do a Curious Cat Q&A, show off my latest comic haul, and then maybe do some unboxings. Let me just say that Motor Crush is easily one of my top five comics to hit the scene within the last couple years. It's amazing. Volume 2 is way better than Volume 1, and I was not expecting that. There were so many twists and turns and suspense in Volume 2 that I was not expecting, and there's something about it that feels very cinematic. You believe in the characters and in the story, and it just feels real and right. I love that we finally got some damn answers in volume two. There was a lot of backstory, a lot of development for the future. And I was stunned when I finally, when we finally got to find out who the Knight Rider was and when we finally found out where Domino comes from and why she can ingest Crush.
But I also really love the art. I love all the, the vibrant pinks and the purples and how sharp the art is. It's something that just really pulls me in. And overall, I mean, I think it goes without saying that this comic book is gonna be a five out of five stars for me. Prism is more complex. I don't wanna rate this comic until more issues come out and until we can get to see more of the story because it's a lot more elusive. It's very complexly written and it is written in prose, which is something that I don't typically reach for in my comics. And Vec, the main character, is very different from the main characters that I connect with. She is a pacifist. She has a lot of feelings. She's very gentle of soul and there's a lot of conflict between her and other characters who believe in active resistance and in violent resistance. So the comic book does create a lot of internal dialogue about what is the right way to resist and the wrong way. It's definitely a political comic. It's definitely one that will make you think that you won't. It's not something that you can just sit down and page through one time and understand the story. It's something that will involve a lot of rereading and consideration, viewing the interviews. It's very complex. That being said, the world building is some of the most opulent and ornate world building that I've seen. Raven, stop. Hey! Raven, can you just stop messing with things? Just stop it. So my understanding of this comic was that Vep goes to this new planet and finds that she has powers there, but that's not exactly the case. Any living creature that exists on the surface of this planet has the ability to tap into the planet's energy and to use it in various ways. In this way, the comic kind of reminds me of the fifth season, and Vep really struggles with getting to tap into the power of the planet. She's actually really bad at it, and I like that because I'm so sick of the trope of the chosen one. Now let's get to our comic book haul. Of course, I had to catch up on Blackbird by Jen Bartel. This was one of my most anticipated comics of last year and it has not disappointed. It's about a young alcoholic Filipino witch who finds that she has incredible powers and has the ability to tap into the spiritual realm. And then I also picked up the latest comics from Superb, which is written by David F. Walker, who is writing Cyborg. Superb is about two children who discover that they have superpowers. One of the children, Jonah, has Down syndrome, and the other kid, Kayla, is a young black girl. One of my favorite things about this comic is that Kayla's race and Jonah's disability are not by any means the focal point. They are aspects to their characters, but they don't drown out the rest of the narrative. The action's amazing, the writing is amazing. I love the pacing and the story and the thrilling aspect. I'm just gonna stop there because everything about this comic speaks to me. Now we're gonna do our Curious Cat Q&A. Your thoughts and opinions on ethnic disabled and LGBTQ representation in media was insightful and fascinating. With this in mind, what is your opinion on Nick Robinson, a straight male, being casted as Simon in Love, Simon? Do you think that the overwhelming response from the film leads the sexuality of the actor to become redundant? The second part of the question, do you think the overwhelming response from the film leads the sexuality of the actor to be redundant? When we're looking at casting, I want queer actors to be considered for queer roles. And as viewers, I want us to think more about how visibility is power. And anytime that you give somebody a voice, you're giving them power in some way, shape, or form. So what does it mean if we're only giving power to heterosexual actors? That's all I'm saying. Is there any particular reading goals you have for this year? I wanna read more comics. I used to read comics primarily before I got into booktube, and then I just kinda of got swept up in wanting to talk about all these books that other people were talking about. So I just put comics on the back burner for the last six months, and now I'm just like super out of the loop, and I just don't, I don't like that. Like comics have been my home for so many years, and I talked about this recently in my, uh, my black trauma porn video, but a large part of the reason why I abandoned books was because I was so tired of reading books where black people were always the slave or the best friend or the hoodlum. And that's why I turned to comics in the first place because comics is where real stories about black characters were being told, where it was just a character who so happened to be black. Them being black wasn't the main point of the story. I'm not focusing on numerical goals this year. I just wanna read books that make me happy and I want to get away from reading books that booktube wants me to read. Not that there's anything wrong with reading popular books, but I wanna reach for the books that I wanna read first and then read popular books second. Like it. Another question is, have you considered writing or have written a book? You know, this is a good question for me because I used to write all the time. When I was 10, 11, 12, I begged my mother to buy me a typewriter and she did. She almost took it away a couple times because she got so sick of hearing me clacking and typing while she was trying to take a nap and stuff and I just, I, I would not get off this damn typewriter. I used to be a writer, but I just got so turned off by the way that black people were represented in books. It just made me think I didn't have a place in the writing world. It made me think that I couldn't be the star of a story. Um, and, and what's awesome is that Blackathon, one of the amazing things about Blackathon is that it's taught me that like 
that's not true. I should turn the light on, it's really dark. That's much better, sorry about that. So, I used to be a writer. I used to want so badly to be a writer. When I was, uh, I think I was 11, I won a poetry contest, and that was really, really fun, and that was one of the most happy experiences I have from my childhood. The best thing that's come out of Blackathon is that it has created these ideas for stories in my head, stories that I really wanna write, and I just feel like my desire to write went into hibernation because I just didn't think it was possible to write stories about anything but trauma. You know, and because of Black Thumb, my desire to write has woken up again and it just, I'm constantly writing things down and, and I don't know if it's something that I would ever share. I don't know if I'm ever gonna like publish a book, but I know that I'm gonna write a book. I have this desire within me to create a story, to see how it would turn out, but I don't necessarily have a desire to share that story. And maybe I will feel differently after I'm done writing it. Maybe I will feel like, hey, this is a story that needs to be told instead of written. So we'll see. Are you planning to do a read and watch style video for Children of Blood and Bone when the film comes out? There's a film in the works? Maybe. I didn't, I didn't know there was a film in the works, so maybe. Uh, I was planning on reading that book sooner rather than later, so probably not, but that doesn't mean I won't watch the film and tweet all my reactions because you know I live on Twitter. What is your Harry Potter house? I am a Ravenclaw. <laughs> Somebody else says name book characters you would fight. Okay, Lola from Motor Crush, that bitch has to go. I also would love to fight Remus Lupin because Remus Lupin is the person that I identify most in the Harry Potter universe. I think that he is one of the most powerful, underrated characters in the series, and I just would love to see how I would match up to him. Like, that's the thing about me is like, I love picking fights, but I'm not sure I'm gonna win. <laughs> If you could meet anyone past or present who would it be and why and I'm going to choose Oscar Wilde because he inspired me so much in high school What are some of your favorite movies or TV shows? Thank you for taking the time to answer. I love your channel. Oh, thank you um, My favorite TV shows NBC's Hannibal if you haven't watched this show and if you like dark thrillers, psychological thrillers, you, you should check the show out. Some of the best well-rounded characters, beautiful writing, excellent cinematography. I just love everything about the show. And also Alana Bloom, so hot. I also love Orphan Black. That's been my shit since day one. Always on team Helena. <laughs> I actually went as Helena for Halloween one year, so. And then my favorite movies. The Fifth Element is my favorite movie of all time. I also love Seven Pounds. I love a good cry. The Invisible, which came out in 2007, it was a Canadian film starring Justin Chatwin and um, Marguerite Levieva. This is one of my favorite films of all time and nobody has ever seen it. So if you've seen The Invisible, please comment down below because I'm so tired of being alone. Oh, The Prestige and The Illusionist. Those are two of my favorite films. If you guys have seen both of those films, tell me out of the two, which one is your favorite? Someone else said, why are you my favorite person ever? I, I don't know. <laughs> Who are your favorite authors to read for fun or escapism versus who are your favorite authors to read because they have something important to say? Doing this anon because I don't feel like creating a profile, but it's Carissa Quinn. <laughs> Hi, Carissa. My favorite authors tend to not have multiple books, so I can't necessarily say like, hey, this is my author that I go to for escapism. And because I'm a little nuts, I dissociate really well, which means that it's easy for me to put myself in a story so I can escape into damn near any story that's enjoyable. I'm really enjoying Natalie C. Anderson, Let's Go Swimming on Doomsday, and I think that this book is, is has a really important message to it, and I know it's gonna be on my top favorites list of 2019. Yeah, I don't know, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that, Carissa, because I don't have a specific answer for the escapism part. Somebody else asked, are you more likely to fall in love with someone who identifies as female? Yes. Boys just don't catch my attention the way that women and non-binary folks do. And I don't think that's ever gonna change, but that doesn't mean that I'm completely like against the idea of dating a man because I'm not. If there was a time machine that would take you to meet some famous person of antiquity, who would you like to talk to? I'm gonna go with Gloria Anzaldúa. She was a Mexican feminist author and she's just, to, my, to this day, she is one of my favorite voices. I love her so much and she had so many revolutionary ideas and she just seems like a wonderful person. I love her interview. So I'm gonna go with Gloria Anzaldúa. If I get to choose another person, it would be Mammy Till Mobley, who is Emmett Till's mother. I just feel such a connection to Mammy Till Mobley. Thankfully, I've never lost a, a son to violence or any son at all, I've never had children. I don't know, I would just like to hear her stories and her perspective and to see who she was outside of her trauma. Okay, so that is the q and I'm sorry it took me so long to answer those questions. Most of those questions were asked in January. My bad. Um, I'm going to get back to reading my comics. I will update y'all before bed. Bye. <laughs> what up, y'all? It is now the 3rd of March. 
This vlog has been awful, but I'm gonna post it anyway because nobody's perfect and sometimes our work just doesn't come out the way that we want it to and I'm not going to hide that. You know what I mean? So here is my shittiest vlog ever and hopefully you will never see another vlog from me that is as bad as this one. I also did not complete my comic TBR, which this whole vlog is supposed to be about comics. <coughs> I did complete volume one of Shuri and I absolutely loved it. I loved everything about this comic. I was very nervous about Nnedi Okorafor handling this character. I didn't know what her education was in the Marvel Universe. I was super nervous about it and she definitely did not disappoint. This is a teen comic and so you're not going to get a lot of the inside jokes and the references that you get in an adult Marvel comic, meaning that those references are still there but they are explained in a teen comic versus in Marvel's adult comics, you kind of just have to know all the lore and have read all of the issues referencing X, Y, and Z characters in order to understand the storyline to its completion. But that wasn't the case with Shuri, uh, which is kind of cool because I'm definitely out of the loop with Black Panther and have been for quite some time. All of that being said, the writing was fantastic. I loved the costumes in this book and Marvel is so well known for their crossovers. So we got amazing crossovers from some of my favorite comic book characters. And I don't wanna spoil it, but I will say that there is a body swap and the person that Shuri swaps bodies with is amazing. I was talking to Justin from Ghost Reader about how body swaps is one of my favorite things to see in comics. I love seeing two characters either get fused together or to change bodies. This happened with Deadpool and Howard the Duck. I have read every single Howard the Duck comic that has ever come out. He's just one of my favorite characters and it was super cool to see him get fused with Deadpool. Is one of the funniest comic runs I've ever read. It's four issues long. You guys should totally check it out if you just want something really funny. I definitely fell way more in love with Shuri as a result of reading this comic and I cannot wait for the issues to continue. The only thing that bugged me about this comic is that there's a scene between, I think her name is Akikyo. I just fucked up her name so my bad, but between her and Storm and Shuri makes a comment where she says, you guys can stop measuring each other's heights later. When I was like, okay, Storm is six foot four, so there's no way that this character, that these characters would even be eye level. And that just kind of annoyed me. It's just another example of Storm's character being drawn slowly over time as less powerful and less fearful. And it just, it just grinds my gears. You know what I'm saying? So other than that little thing, I loved this comic. I cannot wait to continue with the series. Everything about it was fantastic. You guys need to check it out. So all this being said, I'm gonna wrap up this vlog. I am so sorry for what you just witnessed. And if you stuck around for some reason to the end, you're a real one and I love you so much. Blackathon has been so amazing. It's meant so much to me. All of the things that you guys have said, all of the encouragement, the, those of you who reached out to me and said that you've picked up books that you never would have otherwise because of this readathon and now your life is different and better. I've never received more inspiring and heartwarming and thought provoking comments, comments than the comments that I've received on my Blackathon videos. You guys have just been so awesome at engaging with this readathon and you made it 10 billion times better than I was even anticipating or could have dreamed of, of hoping for. So thank you so much. Thanks to all of you who are recent subscribers to my channel. I'm so fucking sorry that this is the first vlog of mine that you're gonna see if you're new here. My vlogs are way better than this. One of my favorite things to put out in my channel is vlogs. It's something that I, I actually pride myself on, so, <laughs> ha. Hmm. I love you guys so much and nothing, seriously nothing makes me happier than being a part of the booktube community, so. Oh, so yes, I obviously did not get to reading the Ironheart series or David F. Walker's Cyborg, so I'm going to continue reading those series in March. Okay, my channel's always a mess. It's not that my channel is garbage, it's more like recycling, you know what I'm saying? It's just like a step above garbage, you know? It's like garbage that, who am I kidding, it's fucking garbage. Thank you.